didn't quite get our timing right there, my fault. So welcome everyone, 12th of April, Sam, Digital Confectioners, shortly. Ta-da, we have a new cluster sponsor. Actually, we haven't signed the paperwork yet, but I think we there's no doubt we're going to. So welcome to Lumen. Um, they will speak at one of these sessions in the next few weeks. So you'll get to hear a little bit more then, or you can go and visit one of our uh, previous uh, podcasts from a few months back. I see Andy Paulson nodding there. Oh, Tech Summit is still planned for 30, Thursday, 24th of November. So if it's not in your calendar already, make it so, and we'll see you then. Tech Week is, they moved the event submission deadline. Uh, I think it's actually now 22nd, which is next week. We've got a few events happening, at least one of which Canterbury Tech is running, but not too late to get a few more events happening. Otherwise, here it is, 16th of May to the 22nd of May. That is Tech Week. Few other upcoming events, and we'll be getting a newsletter out in the next few days with some others embedded in that as well. So, some of these events have been postponed multiple times, as was the tech summit. So, like Electrify was postponed multiple times. So, hope it's well supported a bit uh, later in in May. And that was about all I had. That was easy, wasn't it? So I would like to welcome Sam Evans, uh, who's co-founder and director of Digital Confectioners. So if you could unmute yourself, Sam, and where you go, do some talking. Yeah, thanks. So we're a small game development studio here in um, Canterbury, um, and we've gotten really busy recently. We Oh, here's some slides. We um, have been on the grind for a very long time, working to uh, get to the point where we can make our own games. We started out way back in 2007. It was just me and a friend, James Tan. He um, had a background in pharmacy, so highly relevant for game development. Uh, and I was a web developer, but we decided we wanted to start a game development studio. Um, we initially started off doing contracting work at first for Epic Games on Unreal Engine and eventually taking on bigger and bigger contracts, um, slowly growing our team. By 2012, there were four of us. We had two, two employees, just getting serious. <laughs> and we uh, entered a partnership with um, Alex Quirk, a guy over in the US to make a game called Depth. Um, it took almost three years to build that. And then um, we launched that in late 2014. At that point, we had seven staff. Depth did pretty well for us. Um, allowed us to grow even further. We got up to about 12 staff. And in 2016, we wound up buying Alex out. So Depth became just ours. Um, we were still doing a lot of contracting work through this period, um, probably about 50-50, um, because uh, and and we, we, we were bootstrapped and we're still at this point bootstrapped. So um, getting funding together for games has been tough because they cost millions of dollars to build. Um, in 2018, we released Last Tide. And to show you a little bit of how the numbers look like for these games. So Depth was quite successful for us. And it, at peak, it had about 11,000 concurrent players. And... To get 11,000 concurrent players, we had to do what's called a free weekend, where the game was basically available for people to play it for free. But then if they wanted to keep it beyond the weekend, they could buy it. Um, when we did big sale events, we maybe got up to a few thousand concurrent players. Uh, I think the most players we had without a discount was one or 2,000 concurrent, something like that. That was actually very successful for an indie multiplayer game. There's very few indie multiplayer games that will last years and years and years with a player base and actually be able to make the money to support the team. So it was a really good success for us. We wound up selling over one and a half million copies. And we're really happy with what we managed to achieve with depth. 
recently we've been working on a new game, a, um, a survival and social deception game, which is set in the Northwest Passage above Canada. And it sees, um, it sees you being a crew of Royal Navy sailors who are attempting to find the Northwest Passage, which in the mid 19th century, they surmised must exist, but they, they, they weren't sure of it. Um, and they sent quite a few expeditions up there to find it. These, these are guys that had previously been down and explored Antarctica. Uh, they've been all around the world. This was the cream of the crop for the Royal Navy, had its most powerful point. Um, and these ships were incredible technological marvels. They had um, steam engines in them, provide central heating. They had it all. Um, but uh, to cut a long story short, they all died and there was probably cannibalism. So it, <laughs> that didn't work out the best for them. And our game is set in, in, in that um, sort of bleak, very cold, desolate location. And you're in a team of eight and you're piloting your ship through the Northwest Passage and trying to survive. Um, but plot twist, two of you are possessed by something evil and are trying to ruin everything. So we released into early access back in, actually it was late April last year. And things look pretty good. We got up to about 600 concurrent players not long after we released into early access. And we didn't do any marketing or advertising for early access. This was very much a soft launch, um, very much like putting it out there and then iterating with feedback from the community to make the game better. So we weren't particularly looking to make all our money at that point. Um, and we were actually pretty happy with the game um, and we were slated to release in um, late January, which is just off the right hand side of this chart. But you can see through early access, play, player numbers went up and went down, um, but they were looking very positive and some of the retention metrics we were following looked really good towards the right hand side of this graph. Like we were really happy. The concurrent players don't really show how confident we were, but we, we were feeling pretty confident. Um, but we had a big, a big patch due for launch. Um, but a couple of weeks before launch happened, um, play numbers started going up um, quite significantly. Um, and they headed up towards sort of, I think we're about five or 6,000 concurrent players on our daily peaks on launch day. Um, which was fine because I had built the infrastructure and I had planned it out for 10,000 concurrent users. So we were handling that fine. It was okay. Um, but then launch happened and things just kept growing, particularly in China. Um, and so here we are two and a half months later. And if you can't see it, the release is way down there somewhere. <laughs> and we now have, over 100,000 concurrent players every night, which is a lot more than we planned for. So it has been a very tough couple of months dealing with things. Um, it's been an amazing success, but it's had um, some absolutely monstrous challenges from every angle. Um, cybersecurity, architecture of our systems, uh, staffing, <laughs> just every angle business um, but we're very happy with the success that we've made this, this sees the game be now one of the largest games on steam it regularly gets into the top 10 most played games on steam every night um, and some of the numbers are a bit crazy so we have over a hundred thousand concurrent players every night um, which means there's over two hundred sixty thousand people playing the game every day um, and at peak time, yeah, the infrastructure is handling about 3,000 requests a second. And we buy a lot of server CPUs. Amazon is making a lot of money off us right now. Um, enough such that we buy AWS out of multiple types of instance in multiple data centers every night. <laughs> um, so my code has to fail back from this instance type to that instance type to that instance type and all the AZs and then, yeah. <laughs> Um, but um, we've held it together thus far, um, and we, we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us. We, um, we get multiple DDoS attacks every day, 
um, with the largest DDoS attack we've faced so far being over 100 gigabit of traffic. Um, we've got um, several companies in a bit of an arms race making cheats and hacks for our game. Um, and for those outside the games industry, um, the cheating, the way people buy cheats is they buy a subscription. And it's quite lucrative. They'll spend 50 USD a month or thereabouts to have cheat subscriptions. So the companies making these have often over 100 employees. They're quite large. So it is a challenge to stop the cheats. They are very dedicated. They're very good at reverse engineering things. Um, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, luckily, we have had some really good industry support. It's been great to um, be able to talk to people in the industry that have been, even at a much larger scale than us, the people that have been dealing with millions of concurrent players. Um, and that's really helped. But there's still a huge number of challenges ahead for us. So yeah, we're treading water and trying to put out fires and keep everything <laughs> working. And building the train tracks as the train's going along. And that's basically where we're at at the moment, I guess. <laughs> so, Neil, did you have any questions? Funny you should ask. I, I do it as it happens. Um, so have you still, are you still seeing the largest uptake in China or is it a spread around the world? Why China? What happened? I, I guess with such a population and a, 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 a population of uh, gamers, um once it goes viral as we say there's tremendous upside available is that just a word of mouth yes really yes um so we we did do marketing and pr actions around launch um uh but they were based on the audience that we'd seen through early access which was mostly north america and europe so all, all our targeting was in North America and Europe, and then it blew up in China. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, presumably no language issues then using your game for Chinese language speakers. We were fully translated into both traditional and simplified Chinese. Um, we're in, uh, I think it's 13 or 14 languages. Um, lo localization is incredibly important for games because they are global in nature. Okay, so talk us through what is an average working day for you at the moment. I don't see too much in the way of black black um, rims under your eyes, so you must be getting some sleep at some point in time. But I understand. Yes, I understand. Um, the peak in China is middle of the night for us, so you must have had some interesting personal yeah. challenges managing this. Yeah, probably probably the biggest one is that I'm the entire ops team, so. <laughs> um i am covering the china peak so i'm i'm working a shift from just about 12 30 to 5 um every night just to watch infrastructure and work on infrastructure things and deal with issues over the peak um but of course there's still the day shift to work because there's a company to run um so that has been pretty challenging for the last few months it's been really challenging um but hopefully in the medium to long term, we can scale up a bit and get more people involved. So what do you need? Do you need people with um, big infrastructure experience, scalable infrastructure experience? Yeah, I mean, a number of these people are coming on at the moment. Like we've been leaning on partners like AWS to help us with things. Um, uh, pr prior to this game, for example, we hadn't really bought support from our cloud providers or anything we hadn't really needed it um but this is just at such a scale where we actually just need to throw money at a lot of problems um so we have been doing that yeah hopefully there's money coming in on the revenue side so you can cover the costs yeah it's... there is it's um it's it's been challenging because um the way the Chinese market has played the game is very different to the North American and European market. The North yeah. American, yeah, they they were playing the game sort of like they'd buy the game, play the game for a few hours, maybe 10 hours on average, something like that, over a few months and then leave, whatever, they've had their fun. Um, the way the Chinese market works is they buy the game, they play it an hour a day forever. 
um, it's ridiculous. Uh, the retention stats are just there's some nonsense. Sticky. Very. <laughs> good. Good for you guys. Yeah. Um, so it gives us some big opportunities long term. Here's a question from Ethan. Um, heard about China banning the international version of Steam in China and the China version having very few games allowed. How are people in China accessing your games, if you can talk about it? 100% of them access us through VPNs. That has its own challenges on a networking side. Yeah, I guess it does. I mean, security and so on must be a massive issue for you. Uh, once you yep. go large as you have, it attracts attention from the, the hackers and the DDoS guys and all of a sudden you've got a whole new set of challenges to deal with that you didn't when you were much smaller and not attracting attention. Yeah, and, and being, being in China as well, obviously, um, uh, they don't post about their problems on Steam or tweet about them on Twitter. Um, they're all in... Um, Chinese social media platforms so you have to go to them to find them um, and that's been quite challenging so we've actually had to bring on people who are Chinese <laughs> to help us get in there and um, hear the feedback from players um, so it, yeah it's required a different approach to previous games and the feedback you're getting well people are continuing to play it and the numbers are climbing so what's the future roadmap for this game are you continuing to develop it at the moment or you got yeah. a backlog of stuff to work on yeah there's an infinite amount of stuff we could add that's not a problem prioritization is the only issue um yeah we are continuing to develop it um our plans were certainly less ambitious prior to launch um but now that the game is clearly as large as it is um we are now needing to structure things a little bit differently to um meet the demand as it were um because this game will need a dedicated team of people just working on it long term. And have you got your um, been able to lift your head enough to think about the next project? Andy's asking, Dread Hunger now released and going gangbusters. How much time are you putting into thinking about the next big thing? Yeah, they've already started. Um, the way the the way games normally work is you have to already be ramping up at least into the prototype phase as the previous projects are launching otherwise they won't be ready to take on the team as they ramp down off the previous game um which now presents us with some challenges because we don't necessarily want to ramp people down from <laughs> um but that is what it is <laughs> and, what, and what sort of development time was there for this current game roughly yeah it was about a year prior to early access and then about a year in early access so about two years okay Another questions are flooding in, so let me try and pick a few. Yeah, Edwin says, could be the lockdown in China. 20 million people locked up in Shanghai recently. I guess they needed something to do. Yeah, that threw a spanner in our um, metrics. So generally, we see a bump every weekend. China has this specific shape where there's an early bump due to younger players, and then there's a later bump due to older, more adult players. Um, and on the weekends, that earlier bump goes up far more on Saturday and Sunday than it does on the weekdays. Um, when Shanghai went into lockdown that Saturday, there was no bump. There was no increase in player numbers. Uh, and we thought, oh, that's weird. Um, but that was the day that the Shanghai lockdown was announced. So I guess everyone had run out and was sorting things. Um, Sunday, the bump reappeared. And then Monday, it stayed there. And then Tuesday, it stayed there. So yeah, it, um, it, we, we saw the change in behavior. <laughs> and Daniel Smith is asking, how do, you, how do you make revenue from the China way of playing versus North America? Does, is there a consequence there, the different ways that people play the game? Yeah, there is. That's a good question. The, um, it comes down to really a split between whether you treat a game as a product or as a service. Um, and in some ways, the way Chinese players are playing this game actually forces us to treat it as a service. If we don't, they will simply play it so much that we burn more money in service <laughs> than we ever earn through the game. Right. So um, if, if you have a game, particularly with dedicated infrastructure like that, and people are playing just hundreds of hours of it, which they are, 
um, then yeah, you need to treat it as a service. So that, that means more downloadable content, more microtransactions, and continually updating the game and providing more cool features and things for players over time. And Tim Croft is asking, is the is the one hour that people are playing in China because of the new rule, who knew, allowing only an hour of gameplay for Chinese teenagers? No. Nah. Presumably not if they're using a VPN to access it there. No. Um, uh, the, game, the game is reasonably gory. Um, so the, the younger audience, like it's a game with cannibalism as a core mechanic. So you can literally butcher up your friends, put them in a stew and eat them. It's, you know, not, it's, yeah, it's, it's reasonably gory. <laughs> um, so it's mostly the older age groups that are playing it. So those limitations for under 18s don't really impact us very much. Right. And as far as infrastructure on AWS goes, obviously you've got to flex that up. Presumably you drop it back down uh, when you see the load drop or, or are you at the point where you can actually automate that in some fashion? Oh, it's definitely automated. No way I could do that. Um, the so with, with North American and European markets, you generally see about a two to one ratio between their peaks and their troughs. Um, they, they just have a wider, more diverse set of like um, patterns that people have, whether they work night shift or they, they play earlier or later. China is a very different society. And the difference between peak and trough is about 10 to one. So yeah, we have about a, over 100,000 players at peak, but we'll have about 10,000 players off peak. So yeah, you, you don't want to be running the servers constantly. So, right. so you're having that, to look that at that. That is all automated. You're yeah. having to look at that, the infrastructure requirements by jurisdiction almost because there's different peaks yes. to trough. Every, right. every, every region, every database, every service that's part of the game is auto scaling or has logic to auto scale it up and down on a continual basis. Right. And and serial question asker Andy Paulson, with the success, are you thinking about a possible port to consoles or sticking with Steam for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so that was that was the plan. That was uh, the plan straight after launch. We would just start working on the console port. Um, but when there's a hundred thousand people beating your da door down every day, well, actually, it's several hundred thousand people beating your door down every day. Um, there hasn't been a lot of time to get onto the console port. Um, the plan is definitely still to get the game onto consoles, and maybe further. We'll see. And Jason's asking, did your core game architecture change as, as a result of demand or has it has your architecture catered for the enormous rise in in uh, demand in terms of the game itself like the unreal server and the unreal client no um we have had to completely rebuild large chunks of the game simply because some services turned out didn't work very well in china so they worked fine the whole way through early access but then once our player base was mostly China based, there were a lot of errors. So our VoIP solution had to change. Um, but the back end infrastructure, I have basically just been rebuilding non stop since numbers started exploding. It must be an exciting time for you, but also a painful one. So Jamie Todd's asking some of your growing pains, are they similar to other tech company uh, growth? Um, it's about people, uh, mm -hmm. processes, just flexing the, the infrastructure to cope with demand, mm -hmm. et cetera, not wishing to trivialize it. Those are all difficult things to handle when they're happening at the sort of scale that you're handling, but yeah, yeah, I, it, it is very similar, very similar. And you do have those same pain points. Um, you can't just wave a wand and suddenly get good experienced people um and you can't just wave a wand and all your infrastructure handles higher um numbers um if we go to a million concurrents i'm very scared uh, we can't <laughs> I, I can't handle that um but it looks like we might not maybe <laughs> <laughs> oh, well look my understanding is that finding people with really good unreal experience was already difficult and i don't I'm sure that's not going to change. And people with infrastructure at the experience at the scale that you're talking about, 
aren't uh, exactly commonplace either. So um, you, you're looking no. for new people that are already in short supply. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we <laughs> we keep hearing weird things. Like when AWS tells you, huh, you have a graph database instance. It's really big. I think it's the biggest one in New Zealand. You're like, okay. Um, just, yeah, this, the scale is quite large. Um, thus far, luckily, um, AWS has actually been great because <laughs> we've been able to scale up. But we, we are getting to the point where a lot of those systems are actually going to need to be sharded out and parallelized, and it's a non-trivial thing to do. And Campbell is asking, do you use any tools to help manage that AWS infrastructure? Yep, lots. Like Pulumi, <laughs> never heard of these. Pulumi, Terraform, others. Um, no, so our stack we um, built ourselves, we started building for depth back in 2012 um, to automate dedicated server, um, like managing both bare metal servers as well as cloud-based servers to ramp up and down with peaks. Um, and also just managing things like people's progression and quests and events and all that good stuff. Um, and we've continued to evolve that those applications for Last Tide and now for Dread Hunger. Um, there are service providers that are provided out there, um, like Playfab and the like, but uh, we're not using them for Dread Hunger. We've rolled our own. And Tyler Costa is asking a question in a language that I don't understand, so I'll just read it out. Regarding skills and DLC and microtransactions, have you considered a season pass model? It could be Greek as far as I'm concerned, but hopefully you know what he's talking about. We've considered that. <laughs> Pursed lips says not that seriously yet. Okay, and how many unit sales have you made? Lots. So, so um, we've just crossed uh, a million sales, um, which is insane if you consider that we have over 100,000 people playing every night. So more than 10% of the sales are still logging in and playing every night. <laughs> well, considering you yeah. were fairly happy at, in the early days of this game with 600 current users, I guess it's... Uh... You yeah, we would, would have, we would have considered getting to 10,000 concurrents to have been a big success. So 100,000 is a terrifying success. <laughs> and Rick Hambrook's asking, apart from scale, uh, what have been the biggest surprises uh, or challenges, could be positives or negatives, with Dread Hunger versus your previous games? The, the, the biggest difference has been how players play the game. There's, there's kind of an axiom in our industry that's used for esports, which is that a developer can't build an esport, only a community can build an esport. A community chooses what they take seriously, and if they take it seriously enough, it can become an esport, but no developer can make a game in esport. I mean, you can keep trying and throw money at it, but. And, it, it seems that there is a similar thing here with a service-based game in that you can make a game and try to make it such that it's a service and try to make it such that it's the main game that people will play every day. But really it's up to the community as to how they play the game, how seriously they take it and how they play it. Um, and that's certainly been the case with Dread Hunger where um, uh, these numbers are really because the community has decided that they like the game and they're going to play the game this way. And we are now along for the ride and we try and keep things up for, for them. No longer in charge. You're taking directives from the 100,000 concurrent users. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. But um, definitely the way the Chinese players have taken to the game was by far the biggest surprise. The whole way through early access, China... Well, all of Asia was less than 1% of our sales. So we didn't see this pattern. Um, wow. And then we suddenly did. That's a big shift for you then, considering that, you know, needing to be on top of Chinese social media platforms and so on, that's that's all new. Are there, do, Jamie Todd's asking, are there any, well, I'll rephrase it, are there any advantages for game developers in New Zealand over other jurisdictions? Or is it all challenge and hard work and difficulty raising investment and finding talent? I'm putting words in your mouth, so you take for, over. For the for the most part, 
the industry is just so global that I don't think there are any strong advantages. Um, getting funding here from New Zealand investors has been basically impossible. Um, I'm guessing it might it, be a bit easier now. Just saying. No. No. Um, so as early as a couple of years ago, we were looking for investors and talking to a lot of Kiwi investors. Um, but we're at the point, like with these games, they cost millions of dollars to make. So we're at the point where we say, look, if you can't say the word million, you're actually, you don't have enough money to invest mm -hmm. in us. Um, and that basically ruled out almost all Kiwi investors. Um, most, and we were talking to people, including quite large investment funds like ACC and so forth. Um, and the, the biggest they could do was 100,000, 200,000, maybe over time, they could roll up to 500,000 over multiple years. It just, I can't make a game on that. So for investment, we've only really been talking overseas. Um, and I suspect it'll be the case with a lot of Kiwi game studios, like you see other Kiwi game studios that have taking on foreign investment, whether it's grinding gear, selling to Tencent or um, uh, the other groups um, like Rocketworks getting investment again from Tencent. Um, they're selling to big international players, but that's because the big international players have the capital and are willing to put it down. Um, so I think globally, most studios are talking to the same sort of investors because it is a very capital hungry industry. Um, yeah and i guess you you don't have a viable you can't just release a really small mvp as you might with a new SaaS software product you've got to have a reasonably no. well-developed game in order to attract interest and uh, yeah. and the users yeah the, the the one difference from business software is that you can't pick a tiny niche and just go after that tiny niche. The moment you release anything, you're effectively competing for people's time with every other entertainment product or every other entertainment option that they have. So you're competing with Netflix, you're competing with Fortnite, you're competing with every other option they have for entertainment. So you can make a minimum viable product, but it's very hard to get people to then spend their time on it. Uh, Jeff Brash is asking, Essentially, can you can you somehow bring to life for us the the amount of infrastructure you're you're using to support a hundred thousand plus users? How can you compare it to something for us? Number of databases, instances of CPUs, blah, what? Yeah, so at its core, it's reasonably simple. You have a front-end API that handles all the requests from the game clients that allows them to go, hey, what's my progression? Um, I want to prestige. I want to buy a skin. I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, I want to start a game. Um, there are a number of infrastructure systems that we use third parties for, like lobbies and voice over IP chat. Um, but once they go through that API, um, there's another system that we have for firing up game servers. And that just is watching every region, like geographic region, um, firing up servers as appropriate. Um, and we'll fire, we'll, we'll fire up machines that are like uh, 16 core, 32 threads, 64 gig of RAM, something like that. Um, and they'll run 60 instances of the game. So we'll just fire those up. Um, and at peak, we'll have a few hundred of those running in a region like Hong Kong. Um, and then on the databases side, it's kind of a mix of SQL, GraphDB, and a lot of DynamoDB, a lot of NoSQL, so that we can scale up really big. <laughs> um, well, that would be an awful lot of servers in racks if we were to rewind 15 years. So thank goodness for flexible cloud infrastructure, right? Oh, absolutely. No, it, it wouldn't be possible without our cloud. I mean, uh, the writing was on the raw even back in 2012 when we started working on depth. It was clear that <clears throat> manually installing, like the old sysadmin approach of provisioning servers and installing, that, that was not going to work. Um, and it definitely doesn't. So, yeah, you, you really have to have a, a DevOps approach to things, I guess. Edwin's asking, can you elaborate a bit more on the security challenge you've faced? For example, how did you go about testing the security before you launched? 
Yeah. Security is an interesting one because I have to be careful how much I say. Because <laughs> yeah. um, it's a bit like putting a red flag to a bull. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's bulletproof, they're, right? It's bulletproof. They're, they're probably not on this call, but we have to be we have to be very careful what we announce and say through our uh, official channels because, of course, the people doing their tax are going to be sitting there. <laughs> hey, guys, the game's back up. Uh, yeah, no, you don't want to say that. That's just like an invitation for round two. Um, for the most part, we didn't do a lot of security testing um, prior to launch. Um, it was just leaning on the fact that I've been doing it for a long time and it's a reasonably tight set of APIs. So there's not a lot of data that has to be sanitized. It's just a lot of the infrastructure in games is quite simple. You just do it a lot. So, um, I think, so like you fire up a lot of machines. I, I, I think Hong Kong at peak, we're doing something like 10, 20 gigabit of traffic constantly. Um, but like firing up an individual instance of Unreal and letting it run and, and, and traffic run is not very difficult. You just have to do a lot of it. Um, giving someone progression is not very tricky. It's just a few integers, but there's just millions of people that you have to be tracking it for. Um, so compared to business software, a lot of the requirements are a heck of a lot simpler uh, and the quality bar can be a little bit lower, which is actually very helpful. Um, but yeah, it's just the scale and how fast things move is extreme. And how about um, Jim's asking any plans to integrate blockchain? How do you take payment? At the no. Moment? No? Plastic fantastic payment? So the, ga the game is sold through Steam. Um, so it's sold in about 40 different currencies in over 180 countries. So it's how payment is received is very complicated. Um, Steam has removed all crypto payments. They, they experimented with it. Um, but what they found um, is consistent with what, what, with what we've noticed is that while the technology is extremely exciting and a lot of us are very interested in the technology, um, most of the actual things out there that are using it are just scams. Just a very, very high proportion of the traffic in the crypto world is just scams and nonsense. Um, and that will negatively impact customers. So un until it's more reliable and trustworthy, no, absolutely no plans to integrate anything blockchain. Plus, blockchain doesn't really solve any problems for us. In the gaming space, blockchain is basically a solution looking for problems. Okay. And I should have asked you to do this 20 minutes ago, but can you stop sharing your screen? And yes, I can. We will get to see your smiley face more than your slides. Oh, God, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> any advice for other New Zealand studios if they're interested in tapping into China or the wider Asia markets? That's from Ethan again, who is from Asia, New Zealand, and you should maybe have a conversation with them about how um, we can help. The number one thing that I say to any small studios is localize your game. Do it. It's not optional. Do it. Um, a lot of people look at the costs of localization and think, oh, I'm going to spend thousands of dollars. But if, if you look at it at the scope of your whole project, you're, you're going to spend a percent, two percent, a few percent on localization, and it can potentially double, triple, 10x your income. Just do it. <laughs> well, we better move towards wrapping up because I did say 40 minutes. Um, Tim is asking, how has being so concerned with infrastructure rather than on the development side of the game changed the way you think about the game? So I'm hearing perhaps a bit of rephrase. You put a lot of effort into developing the thing. The thing takes off and then the focus really goes on to making it run and not pissing off the users you've attracted, but that's not a challenge you've had at this scale before. So it's very new. The, we, we do of course have designers and people who are working on the game itself and they're not as much dealing with the scaling issues, although they've had to be pulled onto things like anti-cheater implementation and the like. Um, so there are people who are focused 100% on the game. I am just the unusual weird person that does the not the game stuff. <laughs> Sitting in your dark cave working funny times of day, whereas hopefully other, other people can work daytime. 
talking of which, it's probably time we let you go and get to catch some Zeds. Um, and maybe you can pass the baton to someone else for the night shift. Uh, oh, I've got a bunch of finances to do. Yay. <laughs> you need help, man. You need help. Uh, look, I'm glad you're in that position. and We're all delighted to see a, a local game company hit the sort of users that, that you are. And I'm sure it's challenging times for you, but better that way than a, a complete catastrophe where you've got no users. So uh, Absolutely. Yeah, these are the good problems you hope to have. Yeah. Well, I'm going to thank you for joining us. Um, first time I've met you, Sam. Thank you so much for joining. Everybody else is chipping in on the chat as well to say thanks also. We shall, well, look, maybe we'll, we should have you back in three months time and see um, see what happens once you're up to 250,000 concurrent users. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been unable to predict the game, so I've given up on crystal ball gaze and where the numbers will go. Well, I hope the hockey stick continues to climb upwards and, and right rather than the uh, fades at some point it sounds like you've got some interesting use patterns happening in china that suggest it's going to be reasonably sticky and stay high for a while to some time to come good luck with it thank you so much i'm going to wrap this thing up um the next of these sessions is in is two weeks today same time same place and yes we do have some subject matter sorted out but we just need to finesse some of the wording around it and then we'll tell you guys about it later in the week and that's it for now folks thank you again sam and uh, thanks everyone for joining and chipping in with some really good questions